I think you can hear me better now. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, I forgot. Yeah. So I just repeat briefly what I just said. I'm Corbin, NetBZ developer, and now also HPSD. Uh -huh. So why HPSD? Uh, yeah, because NetBSD is a modern and cool operating system. So uh, it drives lots of uh, research development efforts, like RAMP and Minix. It runs almost everywhere, but it uses CVS for development. And uh, unfortunately, modern coders, like I would define myself maybe, uh, no longer like to use CVS because it's a decentralized world and also Modern users don't want to phone with a Raspberry Pi because it's cool to run NetBSD on a Raspberry Pi, but if you want to work to run NetBSD on your phone, for instance, well, you don't want it to look like this. Maybe it's fine for you, I don't know. And it's a really open phone. You can see whatever is going on. You can see when your battery blows up, it's right there. Uh, this is a really cool project, though. I'm not, I don't mean to say anything wrong, but uh, right now NetBSD runs on this, but you may not want to have this in your pocket every day. However, it pr this proves the point also that NetBSD can run on a phone. So um, it, w it was one of the reasons why I started HPSD in the first place. One of the few reasons, um, one of the lots of reasons. Anyway, uh, NetBSD has tons of cool features, but a lot of them are unfortunately disabled by default, or they are not used much, and they tend to rot. And this is really sad, like him right here. Um, like NetBSD was the first major OS to have signed binary packages or support for signed binary packages because actually they were never generated in the first place, officially at least. Uh, ASLR was here a long time ago but never enabled by default, so it has a few bugs still, uh, even if it does work a bit. SSP is also used in some places but not everywhere, so it's not always possible to build a tree if you enable it for like ARM or places like that. But generally wise, I wanted more freedom to test, break, share, and review code with friends and different my, between my different machines and all of that, and CVS makes it a pain. So HPSD started uh, as sort of a fork of NetBSD using Git. So it started in July 2013, that's a bit more than a year ago, uh, just before the announcement, just in case, I beefed up the web hosting, uh, and I announced it at FrostCon that same month. And my web hosting, in spite of the beefing up, didn't survive a Reddit attack. It, it went on, on Reddit. And um, so after that, I presented the project again a, a bit less rushed at FOSDEM 2014. There is a video for this also. And I presented also a more in-depth uh, opinion about what we could improve in NetBSD regarding processes and so on in Asia BSDCon this year. So it's called Carve in NetBSD, but it was actually from Guillaume Lameyou, another NetBZ developer, last Mayu, and myself. And also right now I'm rushing this talk, unfortunately, uh, but I hope it's gonna be entertaining anyway, or uh, informational at least. Okay, so what do I have today? Actually I have more stuff. I should have uh, taken a bit more hardware on my table, but I have some time for that. Uh, but before going, getting into hardware, uh, I have some mirrors. So Jörg Zonenberger, a NetBZ developer, has worked for a while on converting the CVS tree to Git, through Fossil actually, and he's been publishing this on GitHub. And so I felt like, okay, why not try to work with this instead of the CVS tree? So basically we have a mirror of these two original trees, plus trees where we allow ourselves to modify stuff, one for source, one for package source, and any official developer of the HPSD project can just push code, except for master and the release branches, which are um, man managed by the release manager, meaning me right now, but you can join. Uh, so all it takes to be an official developer is to agree on our current project organization document, it's like one page, and to give me your public SSH key, I just fit it into our system and then you can do whatever you want over SSH, uh, except pushing to master and release branches, because there is still a process. Anyway, so we do have also a couple more repositories than just source and package source. One for the infrastructure work, uh, like where I push the cron jobs and some binaries which are used for bulk builds. The artwork, because we have a very nice logo on the left. We have a mascot, but we don't have a logo for the mascot yet. It's, it's a hedgehog. I have some pictures of hedgehogs, but I don't think you want to, you know, I don't think you're here for watching pictures of hedgehogs. And anyway, I managed the tree with Gitolite, which is an awesome system for managing uh, privilege access on Git repositories. 
he does a lot of stuff for me, which I really appreciate because I really want with this project also to automate a lot of the work since it's right now still a small community, but I hope to grow it a bit, maybe. Uh, so anyway, uh, where we are now, uh, we have two releases. The stable release is based on HPSD6, so it's HPSD6. This way it's less um, confusing, I guess, even if we skipped like five releases or so, but I don't think it matters. Um, HPSD7 is already available, even if it's uh, just actually a fork of the NetBSD7 branch as of a few weeks ago, and I just build sets and they are there. But right now it's not automatically being updated, even though it's a requirement that we have. Uh, we provide signed binary packages, which we maintain for security actually, so they are based on the 2013 Q1 br branch from package source. And we maintain it in a long-term support fashion because actually it's the last branch of NetBSD uh, of package source with modular XORG which was not broken on base. So I had to stick to this version of XORG and drivers to keep it running on my laptop with like possibility to use the Intel driver. So that's another motivation factor for starting the project and maintaining this uh, for security in the longer term. But it was also a big experiment because I was basically, as far as I know, the first one to do this publicly, and I wanted to, to check if actually I could do that. The answer is yes and no. Um, I'm behind sec security updates, but on another hand, with Git, it was very easy to just pull changes from the security updates on the current branch and to get them back. So this, this is quite okay. It's not such a big deal. Uh, and more than that, another thing that, another thing that we achieved is to build the packages in an unprivileged mode. So NetBSD package source, if you want to publish binary packages, usually you will build them as root. And I don't like that. So instead, I managed to use fake root and to trick package source into building packages which, which are exactly like they would be if they would be built privileged, except they are not. So the only issue is when I install then the packages inside the bulk um, the bug builder where I have to, f to use fake root sometimes when it creates users and groups and I have to pre-feed the users and groups. But actually it's possible to automate all of that also because you can put hooks on, package, on packages when they get installed. You create the users and groups ahead of time and it's not also such a big deal. So this works and it, we can do it, yes. One question, are you building all sets of the packages unprivileged in the fake root set? Yeah. So during build time, I had absolutely no issue with no package at all because package source is usually meant to also work unprivileged. So I guess the few issues that there might have been have been around that already. Uh, like you can bootstrap in unprivileged mode, but then it will generate different kind of packages like which are meant only for you and they are slightly different. And uh, the issue that I have is when the install scripts create users and groups or do otherwise privileged operations where they fail. And so in this case, uh, either I run them using fake root or uh, I create the users and groups ahead of time and usually it's, it's okay. So this works. Um, so the current community, if you want to check out uh, what we are up to, we are mostly hanging out on IRC right now. Actually, almost everything is on IRC right now, which is good and bad because then it doesn't get archived even if we have really fruitful discussions. So we have the HPSD channel on Freenode. Uh, we have uh, like five, six developers who are like talking a lot and coding a bit, or coding a lot sometimes, like Jan over there. That's not a real picture of Jan. <laughs> That's all I could find. Sorry, mate. <laughs> and uh, we also have two mailing lists, which are therefore not very active right now, but uh, we have one for users and one for developers. Usually I cross post anyway, because I have only big announcements there because yeah, we don't have much traffic right now, but maybe with more people, hopefully they're going to be more useful. Um, anyway, now to get a bit more into details of more motivations, why I spoke about the phone thingy and and another reason for the for the project. Before doing all of that and joining NetBSD, I was part of the Open Moco adventure, which was uh, an, a smartphone looking like this. Uh, so a bit ugly, I have to admit. 
all plastic. But other than that, it was great. Some people even say it was a new iPhone, the open source <laughs> phone. Yeah, I, I didn't have such high hopes, but I was trying really hard to like make it work because it should have been just the first step for something better. And some of the objectives initially defined were achieved. Like some people managed to get parts of the phone, put something else inside, and make it into a different phone, more powerful, with reusing some of the components. And we now have three, four competing smartphone stacks in open source, including mine. Because uh, at the time, I was not satisfied with Open Hand, which was abandoned, or the Python stuff from OpenMoco, which was also abandoned. Then there was FSO, we just started from scratch, and I didn't see it going anywhere, so I did my own stuff again. Uh, so it's a bit sad on one hand that there were so many different initiatives in parallel, and not like, one with a lot of like uh, active developers on it. But anyway, I didn't stop working on this. But now I prefer NetBSD, so I really want to have NetBSD running on a phone and to use it instead of whatever Android crap I could buy nowadays. Sorry if you have one, I mean, it's just my opinion. But even if it has a part of NetBSD inside the system. So anyway, um, I wrote a desktop environment, and it's, as part of that, I have wrote a telephony uh, framework. And it is my intention as the benevolent dictator uh, to impose the default desktop as, I mean, to impose my desktop as the default one. But then we do have a reference software stack on which everybody must focus, or at least it gets installed by default, so that things are tested and hopefully being debugged and working properly. So the project is called D4OS, something that I've been working on about 10 years right now, by now, if not 13 actually. I started in 2001 in a different way, and it was based on Linux, I have to admit. So uh, D4OS is actually Debian for all. It's not connected to Fedora or whatever. I had the domain name before. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's a bit unfortunate that Fedora happened, well, for me at least. Uh, but uh, anyway, the project is decomposed, composed uh, of three major directions for development, a distributed framework, a self-hosting environment, and a graphical interface. So my real goal is the distributed stuff. Uh, the self-hosted stuff is more for fun and learning. And the graphical interface just happened because I didn't like GNOME or uh, KDE or whatever else there was at the time. It was all slow and sluggish on my Spark 64 machine. And I found out that by doing it myself, I could achieve just as much and it would be actually faster. And today it fits on embedded platforms, therefore. So uh, I can speak more about the distributed stuff a bit later. Technically, it's a lot like what Jordan mentioned uh, inside the keynote to have like distributed single point of access inside the system and, and one way to do, uh, to do everything and to have events all coming from the same place. And this, this is all there, even if it's just a really rough prototype, really hackish, but it used to work at some point. Now I'm currently rewriting everything a bit more seriously, but it's a bit tough to tackle everything at the same time. So anyway, the desktop. Uh, it has a file and desktop manager, it has a panel, a web browser, mail client, telephony application that I mentioned, media player, screen saver, uh, camera application, and so on and so forth, even documentation, all written with GTK2, uh, no other dependencies whenever I could achieve it, and the Unix way, you can just take like the media player alone on its own, it's going to work, unlike some of the GNOME stuff and whatever which need whichever bus or whatever else. What I don't have right now still is a proper window manager, and a session manager also would be nice. Uh, if you want to have a quick look at it, actually I'm running it right now. So if I just leave the PDF viewer, which I, I could have used mine actually, well it was written by a friend, one of the few contributions that I got, so it should be like this, yeah. So this is from the Defora desktop, it even works full screen as far as I know, it's not Great, it doesn't zoom in automatically yet, blah, 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 but it's work in progress. So that's the PDF viewer, I also have a file manager, like in here. Can make things bigger a bit. So I have thumbnails support and um, a plugin system here, so you can have a directory tree, go through your system, blah, 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 like, like you would expect. I also have uh, a camera application, because I'm targeting embedded, so I also have something to take pictures. Hopefully it's going to work. Why does it need to work? Come on. 
Mm. Oh, it's here. OK, I couldn't see it on my screen. So it's, it's busy? Why is it busy? Something is using my camera device for some reason. <laughs> Fuck you, NSA. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I, could, I could show a bit more of this later. Um, for now, back to the presentation, unless you want to see more. Yes. Um, so I'm working on a graphical installer based on the same applications, same like framework that I did. Uh, presentation tool, package manager would be nice also, of course. I have a beginning of a development environment also based on this, with a simulator for embedded devices, where you have a small X window with the same depth DPI, um, not depth, but DPI, same resolution as the actual uh, phone or device you're emulating, and you can check also if the font size is fine, the picture resizing, and so on. A beginning of a graphical disassembler, an hexadecimal editor, and so on. Um, of course, I would like to work more on the distributed stuff. That's something else. Uh, but right now, as things are, I'm already um, fairly well integrated with NetBSD as a thing. I can even show some of that. Like if I disconnect the AC, it should say, maybe, yeah, you can see only part of that. But on the top right, it says ACPI ACAD0, adapter disconnected. I can put it back. It will be happy, full performance, awesome. Of course, for an end user right now, ACPI ACAD0 is not very talkative, but this can be tuned, of course. Um, I have also, what can I show, like the battery uh, report. If I just press the battery button on my laptop, it's going to show this, which is quite neat. So this is like all um, fairly easy to, to implement. Like you just basically do panel message um, with like you can choose a separate icon, I guess, like warning and or I can even have this. Hello, people. And you should say yes. So you can easily script events from the system, have them integrated here, have your own widgets up there. I mean, it's, it's, it works fairly easily. I have to document a bit more, as always. Uh, but I've been giving a couple talks about this. The Defro OS desktop at PackageSourceCon, and a bit more in detail at FOSDEM this year. There are videos online. So if you want to have more details, and we don't have enough time today, uh, we can have a look at this, or come to see me at any time. Uh, the website is defra.org, so you're free to have a look, even if I admit that the website is not in the best shape right now. So now, the hardware. Yes, we can play a bit more with toys. So I brought some stuff, some of which I already demonstrated at a couple different talks. Uh, TouchUnit BSD at EuroBSDCon two years ago, and there are more recent versions of this talk. Uh, it's about a tablet device, which I brought here, which runs NetBSD, uh -huh, with my desktop environment in a finger-friendly mode. I can show a bit what it looks like, what I mean by that. Um, and I really want to run NetBSD or HBSD on my phone, so I also tried to work on the Nokia 900, and I gave a talk about it at BSDCAN a year ago. So this is the tablet that I'm uh, working on sometimes. So it's called the WeTab. It doesn't have a BIOS, so it starts directly into the NetBSD bootloader, which is really cool. We can even hide that with a splash screen, and it would look like a commercial device, like just go straight into like some nice screen, and then after one minute, it boots the user interface. And it has like a slot for a SIM card, a Wi-Fi, and everything works. So if you are interested, you can also sure, uh, come here and touch the device. It will actually react, and hopefully in the same place as where you press the screen. And if not, I'm responsible. I brought the fucking driver. Um, so let's have a look. So unfortunately, my camera doesn't work, and it wouldn't be very practical to show it like this. I don't think our live stream uh, customers, no, clients, is that how you say it? Uh, can't see much right now, so I'm going to try to put some stuff on screen instead. Stuff on screen. So I mentioned this development environment. I have something called the simulator, very original name. And basically, it's like this. It's like Xnest, or um, what's the other one that I'm using? Uh, I forgot. 
uh, Zephyr, Zephyr. And so you can say, OK, I want to run uh, bin, um, no, I put everything in embedded, bin slash panel. And it will run the same panel that I'm running right now on my desktop, but in embedded mode with my current desktop uh, configuration. So unfortunately, it's not very reliable right now because it uses the same font size and everything. Uh, it didn't have much time to tweak, uh, but I can do more. I can run a window manager. Like uh, I can try match box. Hopefully, it's not going to crash everything. OK, it's not that. It should be OK. Otherwise, I can try Metacity. Yes, OK. So now I have even virtual desktops and everything. And I can run uh, the file manager again in embedded mode. And here it is. So the menu bar is gone. So the missing um, actions, which were only found in the menu bar, now go into the toolbar. You still have access over like different views here. Um, you still have access to the plugins. I have some fancy ones, like for Git, where I can initiate. Oh, we can actually play with that. So I can go to slash temp, make a folder. Uh, OK, not in this view. So new folder. This one, we go here. I create a Git repository. It's fine. Now I can create a text file. OK, it's fine. I can, OK, I run out. I, didn't, I don't support adding files, but we, I can do it manually. Git add, blah, blah, blah. Save, and now if I come back here, I can, I should be able to say, OK, I want the log, and there you go, you have it. And it works the same way. It's just running the regular commands in a, in a stupid window. It was the same way for CVS and for SVN. And it's fairly simple to extend. I also have like some properties, and you can also have them here. Blah, blah. In embedded mode, there is like third button emulation through GTK. It just triggers the, the pop-ups. Uh, so basically, that's, that's what it looks like. And of course, I can tweak the configuration to make the um, window manager bar go away, like with Matchbox. I can make the icons a bit bigger. And then with the finger, it's easy to access everything and uh, use the system, even if it's on a small screen. So what can I need? Hopefully, I want my slides again. Um, and then the Nokia 900. So, Unfortunately, I'm afraid it will not be charged. But I can show you anyway. I have an NetBSD kernel running, booting on my 900 phone, if I have it here somewhere. And there is a video also online as part of my talk at BSDCAN, I believe. So you can see it actually booting here. I doubt that it's charged. No, but I can connect it. Um, so uh, I'm not the only one to actually be working on a phone hardware right now inside an NetBSD project. I believe Renu uh, is working on a, a Samsung stock right now. I saw some comments. I don't have any Samsung phone, uh, so I couldn't check anything yet. But uh, looks like I'm not the only one to be to have interest in this, which is really cool. And. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that the demo on this phone right now is, is a long one because it still takes a couple of minutes to boot. But that's with the sources from current from two years ago. And since then, there was a lot of progress. And I couldn't test with a more uh, recent kernel on this hardware yet. No time for that, sorry. But if you want to have a look at NetBSD booting on this, uh, it should work after it charged for a couple of minutes. And I can show you. Uh, I even got to start X sometimes. So we could actually use it as a tablet first, and then hopefully someday give phone calls, I hope. Um, so how to make this whole development um, tasks more convenient, how to make everything easier? Uh, we, as part of HPSD, need to cross-build packages. We are not doing this right now, but there is some um, good stuff going on with uh, NetBSD, with package source, where it should be possible. Um, I believe there is another C wrapper uh, project 
uh, there is a talk about it tomorrow, if I remember, from Jorg and Martin Husemann. And they are making this much more uh, convenient. I didn't follow much myself, but apparently they got a lot of progress. Apparently they've been able to build a lot of different packages, to cross-build lots of different packages. I would really like to have also uh, more graphical tools for debugging and development. Like, I would need an SPI bus simulator because when you work on such stuff, you have dozens of pages of uh, like A4 sheets with registers to push and to pull and like the, some text to explain how the SPI bus works. But to put everything into a picture and like connect this to the driver, the code you're writing and how it's going to work, it's a bit complicated. So to have like graphical simulators for drivers would be, would be awesome. And I don't think it would be so much work. I have a couple ideas how to do this. Um, so this morning, Jordan also mentioned remote debugging. So it's a very good idea. We should have tools for, for this. Uh, more tools, better tools. It's all about the tools, 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 tools. And one such tool that I've been working on as part of HPSD is called Edge. And it's meant to f uh, create ready-to-flash system images. So what do I mean by that? Uh, actually, it's just a shell, a shell script, which takes a bunch of sets, uh, packages. It just uh, generates, uh, for instance, a big file, mounts it as a, as a raw disk uh, image, like with vnconfig. It, it's, it looks like a disk to the system. So you can run fdisk on it. You can partition it, prepare everything, install everything like it would be in a shroot. And bam, you have a bootable system after that. You can even install the bootloader on this virtual device. And it works, supposedly. I hope my, I mean, I, I guess my demo will not work just for the bootloader thing. I can fix it. But anyway, I can show you. It works completely offline. You don't need to start a VM for that. You don't need to run any kind of recipe over SSH or whatever, which I do not like. And it works, therefore, across architecture and systems. I can even generate uh, almost working Debian uh, shroot with Edge right now. I have some support for that. So this is how it looks like right now. Um, so technically, you can use minus h. It says hostname, but really it takes, it looks in a directory for a file called after this hostname for a default configuration and modifications if you need of the recipes to create the to create everything config, config files and so on. A target file name if you want to create not just a shroot but an actual file with a system image. And you can, of course, uh, use minus Q, minus V for a quiet or verbose mode. Uh, some variables are really easy while dealing with, with all of this. Uh, really not easy or uh, useful while dealing with all of this. And let me show you how it all works. OK, so I have a terminal here normally. OK, it was in the right folder. Or no, here's the right folder. So this is Edge here. This, that's the current usage screen. Um, and technically, I can simply run it right now with sudo because it needs to like use vnconfig and so on and mount this fake file system. And I can tell it to use my uh, recipe file for the my base HBSD uh, system, like the, the 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 most basic thing I can generate that that should work. I just output it to a file called base emg, and let's see how it, uh, what it does. So if I do that and enter my password. So it, it will directly uh, partition the fake drive after generating like a sparse file actually when it can with this image. So it's, that's why it's so fast. Uh, it installs a, a kernel. Right now in my recipe file, it's just generic. It's extracting uh, three sets right now, base, etc, and modules. So it's going to take like another eight seconds here, six, four, a bit more. Yeah, etc should be really fast and modules fairly fast. I can zoom in maybe a bit more or put it full screen like this. So that's for base. Please go ahead and complete. Yes, okay, etc now. Simple. I'm using progress from NetBSD for the, the progress bar. And then it installs the bootloader, and that's it. Okay, try to install GnuPG, but I don't have network access right now, or this mirror is not on my machine anymore locally. So now, supposedly, it installed everything. And I can try to 
run QMU on it. I suspect it will fail because of the bootloader thing that I just noticed before this talk, but hopefully I'm going to be able to fix it. Well, let's try to, to launch it anyway first, real quick. Ah, it works. Okay, so I found a, uh, a fix. So I prefer when it's this way. So this is QMU running right now, running on the file which I just generated. So I just generated a working virtual machine image in what, like 15 seconds? And it's booting right now, a bit slow because it's QMU, you don't have KVM or something like that, but after a few more seconds, it should boot a completely working system. And you can pre-configure it, you can put default users, you can enable services, pre-install packages, um, and it's just a sh shell scripting uh, with some helpers which I wrote, so it should be fairly easy to reuse, extend, and so on. And it should also work for uh, embedded devices. I didn't play with it so much yet for uh, like targeting ARM or whatever, but it should just work. I'm not running any binary from the shell root, even for uh, installing packages. So hopefully it's going to be ready to boot now. Yes, so it switches to visa mode because I configured it this way in boot config in my recipe. And this is NetBSD 6.1 from HPSD right now. And as you can see, it should start in it in a second. Yes. And it should give me a prompt. OK. My computer is a bit slow, I'm sorry. It's like. Uh, okay, it doesn't boot rent user right now. That's not supposed to happen. Fail. So there is a fail, but I, I swear that it actually works. Okay. Next time, with more preparation. Uh, so back to the slides. Uh, now moving on to the goals of the project, what we want to achieve after this first year of activity, well, more and more security. It's one of my uh, main uh, areas, personally. I'm, I do this as a living security consultant. Um, I want to have also less software in base, for instance, maybe replace init, like Jordan mentioned also during the keynote. It's an idea that I have in mind for quite a while now. And we have lots and lots of ideas. It's always easier to have ideas than actually doing them, but yeah. It's it's work in progress. There's been some progress. So where to find us? Uh, not surprisingly, on IRC, we have a website, um, hpsd.org. We have two mailing lists, as I mentioned earlier. This is to reach me directly. And hopefully, you're not sleeping right now. So I'd be very happy to uh, see you join and uh, have a look or like say it's cool, because it's always nice when people say it's cool. And thank you for your attention today. Hope to talk to you later. Don't hesitate if you have any questions. Anything more I could show? How much time do I have? OK. Did I speak too fast? OK, cool. So if you can see it, right here, it's a screensaver that I wrote using the default uh, GNOME background, which slightly slides uh, to the bottom right. And there is a NetBSD logo on top of that uh, transparency with fake trans transparency. So if I touch the screen right now, it gives me a prompt where I can slide like this thingy here to unlock. And it gives me my desktop. So like it would be on a regular phone or whatever. I can also set a password instead or anything. It's just a plugin. I like plugins. Uh, so here you have the main menu, like I configured it here. But of course, everything can be modified. I can go to the settings of the panel. And I can say, OK, which applets go on which panel. I have a bunch of different applets. This one tracks the Bluetooth status. There is the SysTray here, a window to, con I mean, a button right now to conveniently close uh, applications, because usually they don't have like the window bar from, because Matchbox doesn't have one. I can also like uh, pop up a virtual keyboard normally. Come on, yes. So I have a virtual keyboard here with different layouts I can switch. Um, it's not always very convenient, but it works. Uh, I can run the file manager, which I saw, be, uh, which I show bef showed before. I can run normally the uh, camera application, which looks like looks like this. I should even be able to run it at full screen. 
uh, and not in this version, but since then I have implemented it. Maybe if I press this. Yes, so right now it's okay, scaling really badly, but uh, I have another mode. <laughs> hey, you can see yourself, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I can even take a picture. It doesn't make noise right now when, you take, when I take pictures, but it should be easy to, to achieve. So here I, here I have my souvenir, maybe, yes. I have a gallery application like on my phone and it starts automatically, automatically the file manager in the right folder, like DCIM, like on a uh, regular phone or camera. And here you can see yourself. And I can go into the preview plugin. Uh, where is it? Here. And if I press edit, it should start GIMP if I configured it or something like that. Maybe I didn't. Or I can view it like in a image viewer like this. So here, here you are. So I'm really trying to like gather the whole user experience from regular devices into this environment. And uh, it's not so bad, I believe. And of course, if you need, there is always a terminal. Yeah. And this one is actually Xterm embedded into a GTK application and you can create new tabs with Xterm inside. Uh, you can also run a native Xterm, of course, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's all open. Um, don't know what else I can show. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Basically, that's that's it for the tablet. I can show the the phone here because it's now booting in a loop. So it's actually booting NetBSD from time to time. Let's see if it has enough battery to do a cold boot. I have to do this a lot because every time I was checking, uh, like testing a new kernel, I had to remove the SD card and put a another one with the new file. So I had to do this a lot. It's not nice for the hardware. Part of this is broken now from using it too much. But uh, if I start the phone now, no, I'm still unhappy. It's to charge more. Yeah. And I wrote the driver for the keypad, which was a bit of a mess. I mean, difficult to achieve. I didn't have much experience with ARM development at that point. But the like gory details are in my BSD can talk, and uh, the keyboard works. It just takes one second right now each time you press a key to actually appear on screen. But this should be uh, possible to fix to improve. And when booting XORG right now, uh, the layout is wrong, so it's still not really usable even with uh, with the keyboard right now. So here it's starting now. There is a small Linux Penguin, but it's actually from Uboot. It's not Linux. And the default, I changed the bootloader, that's why it does that. And uh, with this bootloader, I can start a, a NetBSD ELF kernel, like it's built automatically, like it's built from the, the regular sources. And you can see here the console with green and white, and it's actually NetBSD booting. And if you're very patient, you can actually get, it, get to see it multi-user. And sometimes it starts X. I also wrote uh, some simple drivers for uh, like the camera cover at the back so I can detect these events. I can detect the button pushes here uh, and a couple other things. The camera button. Uh, yeah, so this sort of works. I've been trying to get the touchscreen and the wireless driver to work. They are both on the SPI bus. And when you write at the same time the bus driver and the actual device driver, it's difficult to know where your bug is, which is why I would love to have a simulator or to have another device with a known working SPI bus driver and then I could like plug something else. But yeah, so did it crash or yeah, I guess it did. There is a watchdog also in the bootloader or in the, the, like in the hardware, which is not implemented by NetBSD yet. So if you don't disable this somehow when you boot, the, the device automatically self-reboots right now. But there are ways to work around that. Apparently, this time I didn't. So yeah, that's for the 900. Uh, hopefully more hardware is going to be working soon. But that's what I had. And yeah, I guess I uh, used most of the 10 minutes by now. OK. Well, I would like a drink. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>